Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, so this is Philosophy for Living on Earth, a series of webinars that are coming to you live from the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, so it's a weekly webinar series that we're doing, exploring life's big questions and the answer to these questions that come from the ideas of Ayn Rand. I'm uh, Ankar Gatte, and I'm your host this week. And our big question for today is, is free will an illusion? And as, as usual, as host, I'll give a presentation for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A and discussion. And for that part, my colleague, uh, Aaron Smith, will be joining me then to help uh, moderate and participate in the discussion. But let's, uh, let's jump in, let's get started. So the big question is, for this week, is free will an illusion? And almost everyone today will say that it is, that it might seem like you make choices. It might seem like you have control over your life, but that's an illusion. You don't really have that kind of control. <clears throat> and one of the um, most common kind of explanations for this or explanation for why free will is an illusion, that it can seem like you're making choices, that you're facing genuine alternatives in life, but that you're not, is, the, is an appeal to science and particularly some of the findings in science. So the, the idea is that um, we as individual human beings are like, uh, a, like the solar system. We function like clockwork. So for the solar system, what's been discovered in science, as I think everybody knows, is that you can predict well in advance the motion of the planets, where Venus will be, where Saturn will be in the sky uh, a year, two years from now. If you know the initial conditions or if you know the antecedent factors, you can know with uh, decisiveness, with certainty, where things will end up a year or two years from now. And the idea is that the, the deterministic idea, the idea that we're our journey or course in life is determined by antecedent factors, by things that have come before, not by things that we're doing in the moment, so that we're not actually faced with genuine alternatives over which we have control, which direction we're going to take. This deterministic picture, is it comes from science, and it's typically said that there's two major sort of general forces that are pushing us around and determining where we end up in life. Um, and it will usually put, be put as it's nature and or, and or nurture. So some combination of your uh, material bodily makeup, your DNA and so on, and the environment that you're in, the circumstances you're brought up in, what, how your parents act towards you and so on, some combination of those two factors taken together is what determines your course in life. So you're not in charge, you're not in control, these other factors are, um, and ultimately you, ultimately you could trace them all the way back to um, the, the conditions before you were born. So it's this, this picture that, we're, that we function like the planets in the solar system orbiting the Earth, this is the deterministic picture that almost everyone accepts today. And this is why they say, even if it seems like you're making choices, it's an illusion that you actually have genuine alternatives in life over which you have to select, you have to determine the course that you take. And it's not set, it's not determined by previous conditions, by antecedent factors. It's your choice or your decision that is decisive, not what has come before. This is taken as an illusion because this is what uh, if we're to be scientific and to embrace reason, this is what the position that we have to adopt. Now, most determinists, I think, if they're, um, if they're honest about the position, will say, we don't know for human beings what combination of specific factors determine the actions that you or I or anybody else takes. So whereas for the solar system, you can predict this is where Mars will be, this is where Venus will be. Nobody can do that for any human being, any human action for what they do. You can't say a month from now, this is what Joe Smith is gonna be doing and this is what Susan is gonna be doing and so on. That level of prediction 
Um, it just is not there at all. So the determinist position, I'm going to take here um, Sam Harris as, a, a, as an example. He has a, um, I mean, he's a well-known public figure or public intellectual. He has a little booklet on free will. And his view, this is exactly his view, that your actions are determined, but you don't know what's determining them. So here's one, uh, one passage from his book, and I'm going to take this, we'll use this as a running example. Uh, so he uh, quoted, you are struggling to save money, but you are also tempted to buy a new computer. So it looks like you're facing a choice, a genuine alternative. What am I going to do with my money? Am I going to save it? Maybe you're saving for a house, saving for your college education, something like that. Um, but you also think, well, maybe I should buy a new computer and you're tempted to buy a new computer. So it looks like you have this fork in the road, these alternatives that you have to make a decision about. You have to choose. But that's an illusion. And so continuing the quote, where is the freedom when one of these opposing desires inexplicably triumphs over its rivals? So the idea is, well, you're determined by some antecedent factor. I emphasize the inexplicable. Uh, that's not emphasized in Harris's book, but I'm emphasizing it. You're faced with this seeming alternative, but it's determined by antecedent factors. But you don't know which antecedent factors are determining that if you if it ends up that you put deposit your money in the bank saving for your college education or you buy the new computer, you don't know why you did that. You don't know what antecedent factors or set of factors, what combination of specific nurture and nature um, causes you to do that and determines that you do that. So it's inexplicable. It's like nature and nurture are flipping a coin. And if the specifics are such that it comes up heads, you're going to save the money. If it comes up tails, you're going to buy the new computer. But you don't know what you're doing. You're, you don't. And this is the, the kind of determinist picture. I think the honest picture of it is something's determining you. You don't know what it is. Um, and in that sense, it's inexplicable. Now, I think this picture of what human action looks like is completely wrong. Um, and it's certainly rejected by Ayn Rand and her philosophy of objectivism. That, and that that's this kind of reporting of what is going on internally is wrong. It's not right to think of it as this is some inexplicable outcome, whether you end up saving the money or whether you end up buying a new computer. So objectivism, and that, this is what we're going to focus on here. Objectivism takes the fact of choice seriously, says choice is real, and it runs deeper. And by that, I mean the choices you have um, and that you face in life are deeper and more fundamental than is typically thought when people think about the issue of choice and whether they accept it or dismiss it as an illusion. What Ayn Rand's perspective and objectivism's perspective is, is that you have a fundamental and thinking over the course of your life, a long-term long -term control over the direction of your life, of what you do, and the kind of person that you make yourself into and that you become. That this is, in a, in a fundamental sense, this is chosen, not chosen directly. You can't just, you don't face a choice today, I'm going to be um, this kind of person tomorrow, a different kind of person tomorrow. But viewed longer term, you have this kind of control over the direction of your life and the kind of person you're becoming. And to understand why uh, Ayn Rand and objectivism take this perspective on uh, human life and take this perspective on the individual, the, I think one of the key points to get is that when we think about free will, we tend to think about it in the wrong way, or as I put it here, we're looking in the wrong place for it. And if you go back to Harris's example, it's you're gonna, you have, you got your paycheck, let's say, are you gonna deposit it in the bank, save for your education or save to buy a house, or are you gonna uh, go to Best Buy and buy a new computer or order it on Amazon? It's a choice of two items of content, as I'm putting it. It's, am I going to deposit this check in the bank or am I going to spend it uh, at the store? And it's, 
you just it's it's taken as like this is your choice and what are you going to do and then it's harris's view as well if you're determined one to go one way or the other you don't know what's determining you but for some inexplicable reason you find yourself either at the bank depositing your check or you find yourself on your computer uh, uh, on on the internet maybe on your phone ordering a new laptop from amazon <clears throat> the way ayn rand thinks about choice and the way that objectivism emphasizes that if we're talking about the control that you have it's not primarily about the choice of am i going to save or am i going to spend my paycheck it's about the processing the activity the deliberation or lack of it that your mind engages in or that you engage in and that this is set by you chosen by you so to take harris's example it's not just okay well it's i want to save my money and i also this new computer looks great i want to buy it and i find myself doing one or the other that i think internally if you're introspecting that is not actually what goes on you have a choice to um you can put it in a kind of metaphorical way to put your mind in gear to control direct its activity the way ayn rand will often put it is you have a choice to think or not so in the situation of you've got your paycheck are you going to deposit it in the bank save for your education or a house or are you going to buy a new computer you have control over what your mind does in this situation and circumstances are you going to put your mind in gear are you going to think about it are you going to bring up the reasons like why were you trying to save money is it because um you're you're you want to change careers and you want to go back to school and this is really important to you and and but you need to save for uh your education in order to do that or are you planning to have a family and you want to use the money to buy a house you can bring up and what are the reasons for why i want to do this and then why is this new computer tempting you is it because um well all your friends have new computers so you don't want to look left out and you want to buy it or is it um is there some more important kind of consideration maybe it's that um you're for for you're in school but you're falling behind because your computer keeps crashing you're late on assignments so and you really need a new computer <clears throat> but so it's not just that you have the kind of this fork in the road and you find yourself going down one or the other you have control over the activity the processing the thinking or lack thereof that your mind engages in when you're faced with dealing with trying to understand and deal with the world and your primary control then from the objectivist perspective from Ayn Rand's account or theory of free will it's not about am i going to take the door a or door b or go down road a or road b it's how am i going to make this decision what kind of activity is my mind going to engage in and that you control that you choose that you set that so your primary control is about the processing or activity of your mind not about which direction that it goes in that is the outcome or the result of your um the, the degree to which you thought about what you're doing or didn't think about what you're doing um so and one of the ways that, a different way that she puts this but a related way of in terms of to think or not she says what you have control over the theory is what you have control over is your level of alertness your level of focus of your mind your and you can think of this alertness or focus as a readiness to deal with the world in the best way known to you so again to go back to harris's example it can be um you're faced with am i going to save my money uh, or spend it on a new computer you can bring your mind into focus in order to think about this alternative um and bring try to bring to mind the things of like why am i trying to save money why is it that i'm tempted to buy a new computer even though i'm trying to save money so and think about it deliberate deliberate about it assess the reasons and make a uh rational decision or reach a considered judgment but it's considered because you've activated your mind and are considering it and are grappling with the decision 
And so you can think of that as it's, you're, it's uh, bringing your mind into focus or into full, to be fully alert. Uh, and on the issue of alertness, I, I find this kind of analogy helpful when you think of other conscious uh, animals. I've got two dogs up here on the screen. And I think uh, it's pretty obvious that one dog is more alert than the other dog. <clears throat> um, so, so, so one is, is kind of ears and eyes uh, activated, scanning, probing its environment. Now for a dog, it's more responding. You may have heard a noise and it comes uh, and it's very alert. Uh, if you think of a guard dog or say something like that. But the, for, for we as human beings, our level of mental alertness or focus, we're able to set it and we can maintain it by choice. And that this is how you should think of the root of free will. This is the fundamental control we have over our mind. Again, not about content, but about the activity and its level of alertness, focus, processing. So, and, and that this is chosen, we self, uh, activate and self-set this, um, th this mental state. T to put it in a little less metaphorical terms in, in, in contrast uh, or in comparison to other animals, if you think of the, the, your mind and that you can control its level of focus, alertness, processing, I think there's two major axes in which to think about this and that this is part of Ayn Rand's theory about the nature of free will, that the nature of the control that a human being has over his mind. You have control over the level, uh, or so the amount of energy that you put forth. So the amount of energy that you're exerting, mental energy, um, to exert control over what is going on in your mind. You have that, and then you direct that energy, that effort, towards something. So you have control of the purpose and direction. And let me take now one of these at a time. The way that she thinks that, and the theory is, is discussing the issue of the amount of energy that you're putting forth mentally, the effort and control that you're exerting. You will often get the comparison that your mind can be in focus, in semi-focus or completely drifting. And this is, it's, it's, it's not an either or, you can think of it more like a, a, a dimmer switch that you can set to, to a complete on high, medium, low, and, and um, you have that kind of control over the energy that you're exerting. So I have two images up here, one for focus of a boat that is, uh, that is uh, I mean, the motor's on, there's someone at the helm, it's being directed. There's a lot of effort being exerted uh, or being output here versus a, a boat drifting in the currents, drifting at sea. It's moving around, but there's no energy being exerted by the boat, no effort, no control. So this is, you can think, this is part of the control, the basic control you have over your mind's functioning the amount of energy you're exerting, the effort and control that you're exhibiting or that you're not. And you're not completely unconscious if you're not exhibiting, uh, exerting effort. It's just you're drifting along. Things are happening, but they're happening to you rather than you controlling what is happening in your mind. So this is one aspect of the control she thinks you have. And the other aspect is there's, she'll put it, there's, you can be in focus, alert, thinking versus evading. And this is that you're exerting effort, uh, but what is it directed at? Is it directed at trying to understand the world about you, to deal with the facts, to understand them, to figure out what to do, what the right course of action is? Or are you exerting effort, but you're placing some consideration above the facts? So you're not actually trying to know, trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. <clears throat> and that, um, so one of the ways she describes evasion is willful blindness. So I have someone who's putting a hand up in front of their eyes. They're exerting effort, but effort not to see, not to know, not to understand, not to grasp what the right thing 
to do is not to form, another way you can put it, not to form a considered judgment, but to have a censored reality. So it can be, um, I, I brought up for the Harris example that you're, uh, everybody else has a new computer. I don't want to look like uh, I can't afford one. I don't want to feel like I'm left out. I have to keep up with the Joneses. Even though you know that's not a good reason, I have ample reason to why I should be saving my money. Um, I don't need to keep up with the Joneses. But you can make that, well, yeah, but I don't want to look left out. <laughs> and you can place that consideration above the other facts. And, and, and in that sense, you're engaged in a kind of um, uh, pretense or uh, uh, make-believe. And you're placing some consideration above the facts. And this, in terms of the processing and control you have over your mind, this is an ongoing issue. That it, and there can be all kinds of things that you place above the, flat, uh, above the facts. It can be like my self-image doesn't allow me to say that I made a mistake about something, made a mistake at work, screwed some project up. So I start inventing, well, it wasn't my fault, it was someone else's fault. And so when you know that's not really what happened, but you're now placing some consideration, my self-image, and I can't admit that I made a mistake above the actual facts. So you're exerting effort, energy, but not to know, not to deal with the facts, but in some sense to try to get around them or escape them. And this is, so you have focus versus drift and focus versus evasion. And this is the, the objectivist account of free will in a nutshell, that you have, and you have, to say you have control is that you choose the rationality or lack of rationality of your mental processing. You choose to think or not. Um, <clears throat> and the lack of rationality includes just not exerting effort, drifting along, being more buffeted by the world rather than taking control of your own mind. And it includes the kind of deliberate irrationality of placing some considerations above the fact. So it's, again, the focus versus drift or evasion and I'm capturing by lack of ra rationality, drift or evasion. And the way that she will often put it is you choose to think or not. And this is the fundamental control you have over your life. And now let me make just one um, other point that, that this is, she thinks of this issue as really important both for understanding yourself and your own life and charting your course in life, that this is the fundamental control you have. And if you make yourself um, exert the effort to think and to be rational over time, what you get is you get a better understanding of the world, including of yourself, a better ability to deal with the world. You grow and grow and grow. Um, and if you don't exert this effort or if you build pretenses and, and, and uh, alternatives to the facts. If you evade, it's, um, you, you set yourself on a course that is a downward spiral. So over time, this issue has enormous repercussions for the course that you take in life, what you're able to do, the values and knowledge you're able to reach or not reach. So it has enormous significance for your own life, and because it's chosen, because it's you determine this, it's not set for you, it's not decided by antecedent factors, you determine this, it's the essence of the how to look at the issue of morality, of w when a person is functioning correctly or is good, and when he's functioning incorrectly or is on the side of the bad or the evil. So here's a quote from Atlas Shrugged, from just tying this to the issue of morality. Uh, man has a single basic choice to think or not, and that is the gauge of his virtue, not the degree of your intelligence, but the full and relentless use of your mind, not the extent of your knowledge, but the acceptance of reason as an absolute. Um, so it, and this is the, that it, it's not an issue of how intelligent you are, 
but a directly willed issue. Are you choosing to use your mind to its fullest extent to understand and navigate the world? Or are you not exerting that effort? Or are you trying to escape the facts? That this is what um, the essence of morality comes down to. And this is a very different view that, than how people uh, conventionally think of morality. But it, there's a deep connection between what choices you have in life and the issue then of, are you making the right choices or wrong choices, good and evil? And she has an account of free will, and it's then tied to her account of good and evil, of what is virtuous uh, and what is a vice. Okay, so that is a, I mean, there's much more you could say about uh, Ayn Rand's approach to free will, but that in, uh, I'm trying to give sort of an overview of the way that she thinks about it uh, and why she thinks you have control and why these accounts of that free will is an illusion, that they don't make sense when you're actually introspecting and thinking about the control that you have over your life. Okay, so that um, brings me to the end. We'll uh, open it up for questions in a moment, but there's a couple of things that uh, I need to do before we turn to the questions and discussion portion of today. Uh, let me skip a little thing. So let me remind you just uh, next week, the webinar, it's gonna be, does success in life require compromise? Uh, and uh, Elon Journal will be reading that, so, um, uh, leading that, sorry. So definitely uh, join us for that next week. You can sign up for the whole series and get emails and notifications about all the upcoming ones. Uh, the, the URL is up here on the screen. Um, and if you have, uh, we're always interested in, if you have uh, ideas, suggestions for topics, questions that you want us to cover in a future webinars. And so if you do, certainly uh, email us. You can email us at webinars at einrand.org. And one last thing is that we're, um, we're interested uh, in figuring out who we're reaching in these webinars. So we have a, a little poll of asking sort of your familiarity with Ayn Rand. Are you relatively new to uh, her ideas, her work, or are you, have you been uh, thinking about it, reading it for a number of years now? So let me uh, activate this poll. A, a poll, if you're on Zoom, not, on, not if you're joining us on Facebook, I think, but if you're on Zoom, um, a, a little poll should have popped up uh, and you can uh, respond to that. But let's now uh, turn to some discussion, some Q&A. Uh, and I think now Aaron will be joining us for this portion. Um, and I think I'm supposed to turn off my PowerPoint. Hi, Aaron. Hey. Okay, so uh, we got a number of questions. Uh, we got some on Facebook, some in the chat, and some in the Q&A module. Okay, um, let me just check. So uh, I stopped sh sharing my PowerPoint. It's not showing up for you now. Okay. Yep, just you and me here. Great. Um, question from Sally. Uh, do you think neuroscience will one day prove that we have free will? Um, I don't think that free will is proven. Uh, but, but that, the, the, I think the whole idea of proof presupposes that a person has free will. This is it's something I skipped over um, in the presentation. But the, the whole idea of reasoning is that you're thinking about an issue, yet you have control over your mind. It's not determined by the antecedent factors. So if I gave Harris' ex example, of um, are you going to save your money or are you going to buy it on a new computer? If you took, the, he, so he gives it about a particular desire and a particular action. If you took that same kind of example, but put it more in the realm of knowledge, and you said, look, I'm studying philosophy, I'm thinking about the issue of free will and determinism, I can see some of the reasons why people are on the side of determinism 
I can see some reasons why people are on the side of free will. It's inexplicable why I choose one rather than the other, uh, why I adopt one idea rather than the other. If that was really, if it's determined for you, and it's determined by some antecedent factor, maybe it's if your kindergarten teacher was nice to you, you become a determinist. If they're mean to you, you become uh, an advocate of free will. If that were really the case, it would be like, why do you think one of these ideas is true? You were determined to accept this. So Sam Harris was determined to be a determinist. I was determined to be an advocate of free will. Why well, think one idea is better than the other? It's only if you actually have control over your mind and can direct it and can choose and decide that this in reason and logic is what is the right conclusion to reach. And I'm drawing this conclusion and accepting it because of these reasons, not because some antecedent factor has determined me to accept this. If you have that view, then you don't prove free will. It's a presupposition of reasoning and of all um, scientific knowledge. Do I think for, for neuroscience, when it develops way beyond what it, at the stage it is now, that I think it's very, I mean, it's interesting data, but it's very primitive in what they know. Um, what they will discover will be compatible with the existence of free will. They won't prove the existence of free will, but what they will discover about the mind's functioning will be compatible with the existence of free will. That's what I think. Okay, okay. let's ask sorry, two questions, one from uh, Andres and one from Sally, and they're both another one from Sally, and uh, it, they're related. Um, so the first one is, a determinist will take, uh, this is from Andres. Uh, okay. There's like a statement plus a question. A determinist will take any description we put forward, we, I think, from an objectivist perspective, uh, any description one puts forward of the mental processes of free will, no matter how improved and accurate, and then they'll say, our experience of controlling our thinking is necessarily an illusion because of how causality works. What is the difference between the common modern, quote, scientific view of causality and the objectivist view? Um, okay, let me say a word about this. And this is this, one of the interesting issues about free will. I think it, it's, it's a fundamental issue about human nature, the nature of individuals. It's a, and it's a fundamental philosophical issue and it connects to everything as a result. Um, so we were talking in the previous about it, its connection to the acquisition of knowledge. How do, do we acquire knowledge um, what is the nature of knowledge? And part of what I was sort of indicating is that I think free will is a presupposition when we're talking about scientific knowledge. It's a presupposition. Here, it connects to the issue of causality. So there is a kind of um, view in philosophy that every causal relationship is about antecedent conditions leading to some, some event and then you have that c conditions now, which lead to the next event. And, so, and to think of it as very temporal of, and it's antecedent leading to something. And if you have that view, so if you have the view that everything works like the solar system, um, then it, the, the natural conclusion to draw is, well, everything's deterministic, like the motion of the planets, that it's, if you, the antecedent factors, that's sufficient to know what the planets will be doing a month or two from now. But I think causality is a wider um, principle than that. Causa and, and certainly in objectivism, the formulation is what a thing is determines what it does. It's not a, it, it's essentially not a temporal. It's first A, then B. Um, it's a simultaneous re relationship between the thing's nature and its action, or as it will often be put by Ayn Rand, between its identity and its action. But identity is the nature of the thing. One of the examples that I always use to, to capture that it's not about the antecedents, it's about the thing's nature and its action, and, and the action as the expression of its nature. If you, if you go up on the roof of your house uh, over your driveway and drop things from the roof, you drop a tomato, you drop an egg, you drop a tennis ball, 
the antecedent conditions are the same. For each of them, you're dropping them from the same height. <clears throat> when they hit the ground, very different things happen. The egg cracks open, the yolk oozes out, the tomato splatters, the tennis ball bounces. Why do those different things happen? The antecedents are the same. Why they happen is, well, they're different things. They have different natures and identities. A tomato, an egg, a tennis ball, they're all different. And as a result, the action that they take in specific situation or circumstances is different. And if you look at causality like that, that it's between the thing's nature and its actions, it's not essentially a temporal notion. So it's a discovery that the solar system is, okay, you can think of it as the antecedents um, set up where it's gonna be, where the planets will be now. So, but that you can't um, view that as this is a universal fact about causality. And that's part of what's different about the objectivist account and why it doesn't think everything is determined by antecedent fact. Okay, so I've got a question here from Sally. <clears throat> How can I know whether my choice to think or not to think or to exert effort is truly something that comes from my free will? What if it's uh, something that's initiated by my physiology, context, mood, et cetera? And how do you, and that's related to the previous question because I mean, a determinist will say, yeah, I know it feels like it. It feels like you're seizing the reins, so to speak, and directing your thinking. But how, do you, how can you know that that's really what's going on versus there's something else? Um, it, it, I think it, it feels like it because you are. So it's, it's not, I find myself, so Harris's kind of description is, I find myself depositing the check in the bank or I find myself um, or ordering a computer online from my phone. But it's not you find yourself, it's you exerting. It's, so the experience is, I'm doing this, I'm choosing this. And it, it's to, to say, it's, how do I know it's from my free will, not from something else? It's, free will is not some separate faculty from your mind. Um, and from when we're talking, mind here means your, um, uh, conceptual reasoning mind is you're exerting the effort to understand, to think about it, to focus on the situation, to set your level of um, focus and alertness. You're doing it and it's experienced as I'm doing this. And I think that's sufficient for it's, it's um, for to get introspectively what the experience is. It's not, I find myself doing something. It's the experience is I do it and I set it, I choose it. Um, and it's, and you had the experience is I have alternatives. Like I don't have to exert this effort uh, or it, it, it's for, for, if you put it focus versus drift or focus versus evasion, you have it as an alternative. Like I could push this out of mind and say, I'm not going to deal with this and give it some pseudo explanation of, yeah, I didn't screw up this project. Someone else did. He forgot to do such and such and so forth. And you're just, you know you're making it up. So the experience is I've got genuine alternatives that I'm determining or choosing which I'm taking. So the, the basic introspective is this choice, but it's choice over the activity or processing of your mind. And that's why almost every, not every, but almost every determinist will say, yeah, you have that experience, but it's an illusion. And what objectivism says is you have that experience and there's no reason to dismiss it as an illusion. And indeed, in the end, it's incoherent to dismiss it as an illusion because what you're really dismissing then is your ability to reason. But supposedly what you're doing is reasoning about free will and determinism. Okay, so let, my, let me give my own follow-up to that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I mean, part of what you're saying is that objectivism takes very seriously the first-hand experience that you have introspectively of your own managing of your cognitive faculties or your mind or your activity, and that you can't banish that or treat it as, oh, that's not really real. Because, um, I mean, the, the something there has to be something important with the fact that there is a real experience of directing your mind, asking yourself questions, considering the answers, figuring out, am I 
am I, am I, am I going deep enough? Am I thinking more about this? And things which you, you experience as you're not in control. Like I can't get that stupid song out of my head or something that you just uh, keeps hearing on the radio and it keeps popping into your head. And you can differentiate between those things that where, yeah, that's going on or you're driving to work and all of a sudden you're thinking about something and you're not really, you're not directing yourself. It's just the thoughts are sort of running through and they're connecting and what about this? And oh yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. later on today. And it's, it, it feels undirected. So something about we take very seriously that but then you can feel like, okay, I'm, my mind is wandering and you're self-conscious of that. And like, okay, what am I, okay, I'm driving to do this webinar. And it's like, you pull your mind back into focus. And this is why that issue of causality is so important. Because if you, if we say, no, that's the basic data from where you make these differentiations for focus in control, this is up to me versus things that aren't. But then if you, I mean, but then if the, if the notion of causality is all effects are necessitated by antecedent factors, then the only answer is, yeah, but it's got to be an illusion. So, I mean, the, the issue of causality has to be addressed and, and, and it's, you have to say what's wrong with the way they think about causality because they'll keep defaulting back to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the view of causality that leads them to think it has to be an illusion. And it's important that an illusion means it's something real. So they're not dismissing the phenomenon, it's just, it can't be what it seems like because we've got other considerations that tell us, no, it couldn't be like this. And part, yeah, part of what Ayn Rand and Objective is challenging is that these other considerations aren't, don't lead to the conclusion that it has to be an illusion. And I think the point you made about that um, you have many instances in your mental life and mental activity where you're not fully in control, that, that kind of contrast is important. And people often will ask when she says, it's a choice to think or not, to focus or not. What that, all that means is the attempt, I mean, is the exertion of energy and directed towards the goal of trying to understand. But it's no guarantee that you're gonna be able to understand. Um, it, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to think very productively even about, like you could be super tired and so on and it's, I'm exerting energy, but I don't have much energy to exert. And there's not much I can do. And what, probably what I should do is go to sleep and think about this in the morning. Or you can think of it often thinking you're trying to concentrate on one particular problem. But that can be, um, there can be all kinds of things that intrude in that. If you've got some disaster happening in at home, uh, whatever your spouse has called you that the bathroom pipes are leaking and whatnot, and you're trying, well, I've got this important thing to do, but in back of your mind as well, this is a disaster that I should deal with. It's that intrudes and you don't have control over that kind of thing, but that's very different than the basic control you have about the direction your mind is headed. Okay. So let me ask another question. This is a question coming from Rick. Uh, he says, <clears throat> does Rand think that the truth of free will logically entails the falsity of determinism or that we can, or that both can be true? And for the more philosophical out there, I mean, this raises the issue of compatibilism. Is it, is it, can you have free will and determinism or, or are those just, it's one or the other? Um, yeah, so I think the, the, her position squarely is they're incompatible. Um, what determinism means is it's, it's antecedent factors determine the present. And that means there's no genuine alternatives in the present. And the, her whole view of free will is choice is a selection between alternatives. Um, and if we're thinking of the basic choice, the selection of the amount of energy you're exerting, mental effort you're exerting, and towards what? Towards the goal of understanding or towards putting some consideration or other above understanding and above figuring out what the right thing to do is. That's a genuine alternative. But often when people ask about free will and determinism, determinism is, as we've been talking about, is synonymous with causality. So she thinks free will and causality are exist I mean, she's adamant that the law of causality is a law about the nature of reality, that actions are caused by the nature of the thing acting. And that's true for human beings. So 
our nature is such that we face choices that and where this action is an action that we take that we choose between alternatives the, the choosing is the action that we have as a result of our nature so she thinks free will and causality are compatible and she's an advocate of both she doesn't think free will and universal determinism are compatible. question from skylar uh, and this is related to another question. Uh, it's why do religionists hold faith and free will together in a kind of a package? Like why do the, why do they think faith and free will go together? Uh, and then there's another question about um, uh, does free will require kind of an immaterial soul? Um, let's take the first one. So I think when you look at religions historically, and certainly this is true of Christianity, it's not the case that all the major religious thinkers are on the side of free will. And there's big questions when they're thinking about the nature of God, that he's all knowing, uh, all powerful, and so, that he knows the future, so he knows everything that will happen, it looks very deterministic in the sense that there's it, there's one plan, it's set by him, he knows everything that's going to happen. It looks like a clockwork universe. So there's a lot that pushes towards determinism. But I think in the more modern world, the tendency is to place um, faith, religion, the supernatural, and free will together. And that comes out of the enlightenment perspective that if you're going to be scientific rational accept cause and effect you have to be a determinist so in order to make room for free will you have to say there's some non-rational non-scientific mystical force in the world and in, in the end the supernatural uh, element in human beings that can explain why they can escape cause and effect and function free with, freely. So the antecedent factors don't determine what they do. And this viewpoint, I think, is cemented home. So it's cemented as this is, these are the alternatives to be uh, scientific, rational, embrace cause and effect and say free will is an illusion or to say free will is real and to say there's some supernatural element that resides. And this is, uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, I think really hammers this home, that these are your alternatives. And most people have accepted this, that this is how you have to look at it. Um, so now if you're an advocate of free will, almost everyone assumes you're on the side of religion, on the side of supernatural. You think there's this element in human beings and often it's, I mean, God has injected this element into human beings. And one of the ways of spelling that out or trying, trying to flesh that out is an immaterial soul, which connects to the other aspect of it, that in this world of natural cause and effect, and will often be put, but it doesn't have to be put as a material world, but the natural world of cause and effect, you can't have free will. So you need immaterial really here means supernatural. I think it's you need something that's not governed by cause and effect. It's immaterial, and it, but all you're doing now is saying it's not this. So it's it's not material. It's not subject to any laws of science. So it, you're just casting it in negatives, and that often the supernatural would just be cast. It's not anything you know. It's something that is unknown, and I can't specify, and I can't give any nature or identity to it. Supernatural literally means it transcends or goes above nature. Um, so that's, I think, the, what has happened in terms of this debate. But yeah, Aaron, you want to add? Yeah, because I think, uh, so, I mean, we're both philosophers. We're used to our whole background is dealing with other philosophers often. And I mean, I think in, in philosophical circles, um, it, the so some people will say things like, well, people uh, want to advocate determinism because they want to escape moral responsibility and so on. But I think in, in intellectual circles, um, philosophical circles, I think it's run by two things. One, if you, you have to have an account of human nature that is 
scientifically respectable, that it integrates with what we know about science. You have to have some sense of what causality looks like. And, and then they have that view about what causality looks like. It's antecedent factors necessitate and so on clockwork. And then also their view is they're predominantly, I think, materialists. So the view is you have to have necessitation by prior factors because that's what causality is. What do you reject causality? Are you one of those? And it's just magic. Uh, or if you say, well, if everything's material, <laughs> don't we just push back into the clockwork? So you either have to advocate something non-material or otherwise you're back to material equals plot clockwork equals no free will. So how does, what do we say to the materialists? Yeah. Um, um, and it, I mean, Rand's view is that free will as, as an aspect of your reasoning faculty and an aspect of your consciousness, if, if, matter doesn't just mean something that exists. If it's, if it's a narrower specification of something that exists, you're distinguishing mind from matter or consciousness from the things in the world that consciousness observe, absorb, uh, observes. And if that's what you mean by matter, then what, what we're dealing with is something that's not matter. Uh, but that's not immaterial brings in. It's something that transcends the natural world. It's your mind, a consciousness, yours, mine, a dog's, a cat's is part of the material world. And that's it's part or put it better, put it better. It's part of the natural world. And material versus mind is just a distinction you're making within the natural world. Um, and in that sense, you can say that it's what you're dealing with is something that's not material, but that doesn't mean not natural. And Ayn Rand's adamant about that, that it doesn't mean you need something supernatural. Okay, and I'm not sure how much we want to get into this one, but we got a question from Jason uh, about the Libet stuff. So uh, the question is, would you speak to Harris's point about scientific tests on the brain that apparently show that we're set to take an action before we experience the choice to take that action? Um, I think there's, I mean, we, we could say a, a word in it. I, I think there's a, a lot in the interpretation of that experiment that doesn't make sense to me. And there's some good books on that, that uh, deal, deal with this. So it, it's, not, it's not only sort of objectivists who have problems with the, the, the experiment and what it's taken, what it's interpreted, the, what, how the results are interpreted. Um, I mean, one of my criticisms of it is I don't know what they expected or uh, uh, putting it a little differently. The interpretation is treating free will as supernatural. But if you view it as a natural phenomenon, then the, I don't find the experiment and its data tell, it tells you anything much. I mean, part of the, the um, setup of it is they explain to the subjects in the experiment that I, I forget if it was to move your arm or what, what it was, it, it, sort, sort of some random urge that when you feel this urge, but you normally don't feel this urge, so you're already setting up your mind, like tell me in a sort of kind of random way to move my arm or not, and then I'm going to decide if I'm going to do it or not. There, so there's a whole prep for it which will have all kinds of um, brain activity involved with it, you would expect then to get some kind of urge. So, so the, the fact that they're finding brain activity before a person takes the action, so this is exactly what you would expect on a naturalistic view of free will and of the control and alternatives you have. So when I looked at it, I, I found it so underwhelming as that it tells you anything. Um, but as I say, there's much more detailed uh, uh, discussion and criticism of, of the interpretation of the experiment that you can find. Now you're muted, yeah. Let's, let's do a little rapid fire here. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can get some uh, quick ones. Is the word, this is a question from Sam on Facebook. Uh, is the word free in free will redundant? Is there such a thing as an unfree will? 
Um, I mean, it. Dep I don't think it's redundant if you're thinking about other animals and you're thinking if will is something like uh, mental effort uh, or conscious effort, maybe is, the, is a better way to put it. I think free then means it's fully and directly under the control of the agent. Okay. Okay, we can go quick to another one. Uh, another question from Sally. And thanks for all your questions, Sally. You're, you're, you're loading it up, which I like, I like that. Um, is scientific reductionism a fundamentally flawed account of reality? Um, that's not a yes or no. That's not a quick, and, and it, it depends a lot on what is meant by reductionism. Yeah. Um, so that's a complicated question. Okay, so let's the we'll, we'll move on from this one. Um, what do you think is going on with Sam Harris's method of thinking about this issue? Like, what's off about it? Like, where is he going wrong? Like, if you. Uh, well, I think the major thing is that that it's it's a it's a positive in the sense that I want to be scientific. Uh, I want to be rational. I want to respect causality. And if you have a wrong view of causality and what science depends on, then it's you're going to be primed to think free will has to be an illusion. So I think that's the major thing. But I also think he's wrong introspectively, just his descriptions of what goes on. And he's but he's pushed there because of the prior issue that free will has to be an illusion. Uh, and if we're going to preserve causality in science, you have to almost you have to dismiss what actually is happening in your mind. I think, but I, so that the primary is what we've been talking about in terms of science and causality. Okay, so uh, a question from Evan and a question from David, and they're the, they're similar questions. Do people is it right that people have differing degrees of self control, like impulse control? Uh, and then David asks the same question for ability to focus. Like, do people have like you're a lot? You have a better ability to focus than I do, or or uh, more self control that you can exert, and and I'm a wanton. <laughs> um, uh, so I think in the fundamental sense, when we're talking about a choice to focus or not, or a choice to think or not, there's not that kind of difference. But what it's like when you're exerting the effort to be in control, I think can vary. And um, your past choices and what you've done in the past can have real ramifications on this. So if you, and this again, it's why it's important to distinguish between focus as a basic choice and something like concentration. I think there's things you can do to improve your concentration. And one of the worries in the modern world with all the uh, you have a phone in your pocket all these kinds of email and 100 notifications and pings and so on is that this is affecting people's ability to concentrate so they can be in focus and wanting to concentrate on some particular thing but it's harder than it was for someone 50 years ago and that kind of difference in terms of mental function i think there's a lot like that but there, you have to distinguish between exerting the basic effort which I don't think that, that um, I mean, leaving aside damage to the brain or something like that, that's not variable in the way that all kinds of things are when you're exerting the effort. Are you able to concentrate? How productive is your thinking? If you've evaded a lot, often what happens is you have all kinds of things telling you, well, don't go there because that's, you've erected a house of cards in a world of pretense and it will start unraveling if you push anywhere there. So avoid that. And someone who hasn't evaded doesn't get all those kinds of warnings about danger here, danger there. And that's so it's a very different experience. But that's you have to distinguish between being in focus and then what you're able to do and so on. And the choosing of being in focus and exerting that effort or not. OK, so we have a we have one minute left. Uh, I don't know if you have any closing remarks about uh, yeah, and I should, uh, I, they always want us <coughs> to remind people about the next uh, webinar again. Uh, so j just to bring it up again. Um, so next week, it's, we're doing, does success in life require 
compromise, so an issue about uh, morality and how to function in life. Alain Giorno, our colleague, will be leading that. So join us again, uh, same time, Saturday, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific for that. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for all the questions. And thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Ankar. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.